open controls. Through the years, over the last decade or so, various video production companies have advertised their latest product in which they tell us that they have put on videotape a portrayal of some portion of the Bible. In my personal judgment, most of these are done with little regard for the accuracy of the scriptures, but occasionally there are some that are done very accurately and very effectively. And some seven or eight years ago, maybe it's been closer to 10 now, there was a company that was formed by the name of the Genesis Project, and they produced what was titled the Media Bible, in which they produced eight videotapes, four on the book of Genesis, four on the book of Luke. And in each of those tapes, they simply hired professional actors to act out the part that you find written in the Bible, but they did their dialogue in either in Hebrew or Greek, depending upon which book, and then a voiceover, that of Alexander Scorby, a professional actor and reader, read the King James Version account of that which you were seeing on the screen. In my judgment, it's one of the finest pieces of video portrayal of what the Bible teaches that I have seen. And there is one moment in each of these that has always really gripped my heart. The one in Genesis is that moment when Abraham went to offer Isaac. And as they made their way to that Mount Moriah, and his heart hurting because this promised son was to be laid upon an altar and sacrificed. He approached it with faith in God that God would not go back on his word, that even if he had to, he would raise this son from the dead. And when God stayed his hand, and did not let him kill his son. <clears throat> it is portrayed visually that he reached and took the boy into his arms. And in my terminology, he bear hugged him and wept. And even though the text in Genesis does not spell that out, you know that there had to be a very moving moment. In the book of Luke, that moment that grips my heart so much, one that is portrayed as well or described for us as well in the book of Matthew, is that moment when the Apostle Peter fulfilled a prophecy that he didn't want to fulfill. When he brought to reality that which he denied would ever come to pass. I want you to read that with me. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 27, 26 rather. Matthew 26. And that which we shall read is at that moment in time when Jesus has been arrested, has been carried to Caiaphas the high priest, 
where the scribes and the elders were assembled and began to try him and to interrogate him. And outside in the courtyard, the following scene took place, beginning at verse 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. A couple of Sundays ago, <clears throat> I presented to you a, a sermon on weeping, in which we explored what the Bible teaches about weeping and the various forms that the word has that Sometimes the Bible says someone wept, as in John 11:35, the one says that Jesus wept, and it simply means that he cried silently, tears down his face, but no sobbing. But when the Bible tells us here that Peter wept, it's a different word. And it means that he wept out loud, he sobbed. And so very appropriately, when that is portrayed in that videotape in Luke, the actor portraying Peter, leaning up against a wall, is heard sobbing, heartbroken. What's the English word for it here? Bitterly. He wept bitterly. There are not many words in the English language that can describe the condition of a person that would be a sadder commentary than the word bitterly or bitterness or bitter. Now, we use the word bitter <clears throat> in a lot of different ways in our language. We use the word bitter to contrast the taste of something with that which would be sweet to the taste. We taste a piece of candy and we say, oh, it tastes sweet. We taste something else and say, oh, that's not sweet, that's bitter. It's one of the reasons I don't eat pickles. They're bitter to me. Can't think of a thing you can do to a cucumber to make me want to eat it because it's always made the taste bitter in some way or another to my taste buds. So most of us <clears throat> prefer things that are sweet as opposed to bitter. But that's just one little tiny part of our use of the word. We use the word bitter sometimes to refer to the way that we speak words someone indicates an intense animosity towards someone else by the sarcastic, biting, and sharp, hateful words that they speak about that person. And we would say, ooh, boy, is there a bitter rivalry there? I mean, there is just such bitterness in that person. 
we use the word bitter to refer sometimes to the disposition that one has toward life in general. Someone becomes cynical just about life. Just They look at everything through negative, critical eyes. And they're, they're not going to see much, and they're not going to see many people that will get positive comments from this person. That even the best of situations, this bitter person, this bitter disposition to person, will see something to criticize. I notice people in the church that way sometimes when <clears throat> commenting about <clears throat> some good congregation We'll see nothing but the bad in that church. And we all recognize that no church is perfect, and so you can always find the bad. But when you don't see anything but the bad, it indicates a bitter or sour disposition. We use the word bitter also to refer to some experience that we've had or that someone else has had. It may be some misfortune. Someone may be in an automobile accident and have both legs cut off. And you see that person turn bitter because of the misfortune that has come to him. Or you, you see some man or woman lose a mate, maybe early in life, maybe late in life, and you see that person look at others still with their mates and have a bitterness connected back somewhat to the sermon this morning of a little bit of envy there that the person has a resentful awareness of the fortune of another compared to his or her own misfortune someone's health goes down, maybe plummets, just all of a sudden there is a terrible health problem. And you see bitterness. Maybe a, a mother or a daddy turns bitter at the death of a child. I have known of that kind of thing happening at times after the death of a child when in the presence of the corpse by the casket a reference be made to God and the parent lashes out and says I don't want to hear anything about God. There is no God. If there were a God, my son wouldn't be lying in that casket right now. Bitterness. That resentment that builds up in one's heart over misfortune. And then we use the word bitterness as in the case of the Apostle Peter. When someone sheds tears or feels such intense sorrow or intense grief of regret, I watched a man cry one time in a 
a dressing room back behind the auditorium, a room there for people who were to be baptized to dress in. And I had just baptized him. And he wept. I've seen people weep, usually just overcome with happiness. But when I saw, saw this man starting to cry, I thought, I just had a sense that there was something different about his tears. And he just stood there crying for such a long time. And finally, he began to say, Oh, how ashamed I am at how long I lived in sin and how long it took me to see what's right. He was weeping bitterly. Regret. And that probably is one of the challenges facing all of us to some degree at some time or another for, again, referring back to a, a quotation that I gave you not too many weeks ago of all sad words of tongue and pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. And we have regret so many times over things that could have been different might have been different, wished we had done something differently. And the regret, the sorrow that is there, and we weep over it, bitter tears. Well, <clears throat> just in the same way that you and I use bitter or bitterly or bitterness, depending on what form of grammar uh, or what grammar or the form of speech that we're using, uh, sentence construction. The, in the same way we use the word in different ways, the Bible also does that. Here we have read of Peter's weeping bitterly. Now that's an adverb. Describing the word of action, the verb wept. He wept bitterly describing the intensity of his regret uh, instantly his mind just flashed back to that moment when they were leaving Jerusalem just hours before it hadn't even been a day just hours before and Jesus had told them before this night is gone some of you will deny me and old outspoken Peter said, oh, uh, uh, not me, Lord. Now, I might die for you, but I would never deny you. And Jesus said, Peter, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And the instant he said, I don't know that man. And he heard that rooster crow. He wept. I told you in 92 when Phyllis and I got back from our trip to the Bible land that you so graciously provided for us that our first night in Jerusalem, it was cool enough that we slept with a window ajar. And about four o'clock in the morning, I heard a rooster crow. And you know where my mind went. We can relate to Peter, can't we? But I want you to look at another text with me about bitterness. <clears throat> Turn your Bible to Colossians. <clears throat> Colossians chapter three. And this, it shows us a different usage of the word. And I want you to read three verses with me. Verse 19, 
Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. In verse 19, the commandment that is placed upon husbands is first to love their wives. The outgrowth of true love or genuine love is to treat them in the right way. And the last part of verse 19 gives the negative side of it, of how when one doesn't love his wife, he might be bitter against them. It's an interesting word there. It's When you look it up in the original language, you find that it could be translated a little bit differently, and in some of the more recent translations, it is translated differently because it literally means do not make them bitter. How would a husband make his wife bitter? By being harsh, and it's so translated. I think it's in the New King James Version. Be not harsh against them. Don't speak harshly or behave in a harsh, unthoughtful, insensitive, unkind way, but treat them in a way that will prompt their respect and love and appreciation, but don't embitter them. There is a a form of the Greek word from which bitter comes that takes on that uh, part, that, that definition, to make bitter or to embitter. Now, the reason I had you to read on down to verse 21, interestingly, that's the meaning of the first part of verse 21. Fathers, provoke your children, provoke not your children to anger and literally translated, do not embitter your children, lest they become discouraged. Well, how would a daddy do that? A daddy could make his child bitter, for an example, by being so demanding that there's no way in the world the child could ever please the daddy. And that the daddy is just totally insensitive to the humanity of the child and makes such outrageous demands upon the child and sees nothing but the good, the bad in the child and never sees the good in the child so that the child becomes so discouraged and just becomes bitter about the whole situation. I don't even like being his kid because I, it just seems that there's nothing I can do to get his approval. What do I have to do to get his love? And the wife could be made to feel the same way. So there is a use of the word bitter. Be not bitter against them. Don't treat her in a way that will result in your wife being bitter. Turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 12. Let's look now at another text that uses the word in a, yet another way, a different way. <clears throat> Start reading with me at verse 12. Hebrews 12, verse 12. Now before we read, let me remind you that this epistle was written to the Christians who were facing severe persecution. It was written to encourage them to be faithful, to be steadfast in spite of the persecutions that would come and for them to hold on and be steadfast in their service to God. Now with that context, verse 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. 
looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby, thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now what's the Hebrew writer's point here? His point is this, that you in your life as a Christian, your lives as Christians collectively must be on guard lest there spring up among you a root of bitterness that would lead you astray. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to hold your place right there in Hebrews and I want you to turn back to the book of Deuteronomy to chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and read one verse with me. We're not, we're not going to take time tonight to read the entire context of this. But this is a part of the speech that Moses made to the Israelites just as his parting speech, his, his farewell speech to them. And as they were, remember when they were about to go into the land of Canaan, the promised land? He was so concerned that when they got over there that they would fall away, that they would go astray, that they wouldn't be faithful to God. And so he kept reminding them in this farewell speech of how these people, these Israelites, had before time and time and time again fallen away and gone astray. Look at verse 18. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. The, the imagery here is <clears throat> that Moses was saying, here you have this field of growing plants, all of which are good plants, but there springs up this one plant that is bad, that is bitter. It's not the, doesn't produce the sweet fruit that the other plants do. It produces a bitter fruit. And you have to be on guard that it doesn't spoil or contaminate everything around it. Now, it takes the form of a human being. And so he describes it as the root of gall or wormwood. Well, here in, now back to Hebrews, here in the Hebrew letter, the Hebrew writer says, it's a root of bitterness spring up among you. Well, what would, what would that be like? It'd be someone in our presence right here tonight, someone in this audience that would rise up and start teaching things that would lead us astray. We are, as plants growing in the vineyard of our Lord, as he intends, but there rises up one among us who would lead us away from the Lord and in the imagery that is given here that becomes a bitter plant. It bears bitter fruit, not the sweet fruit that God wants us to bear, but bears bitter fruit. And that could happen in the Wood Avenue Church of Christ. It could happen in any congregation. So God says, through the Hebrew writer, you must make sure, stay on guard, lest there be this root of bitterness that springs up among you and that leads you away. It's happened before. It happened in the Israelite nation numerous times. And it's happened among God's people in previous generations. We're not immune to that possibility. So we need to be careful lest there spring up among us a root of bitterness that would be a fruit-bearing situation that would be unpleasant to the taste of God. Verse 19. 
Finally, turn your book, to, your Bible, to the book of James, chapter three. James chapter three. Let's read now what we read this morning, beginning at verse 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Now this morning we talked about envy. We talked about that resentful awareness. You see somebody with a good fortune. You see somebody able to do a certain thing. You see somebody receiving a certain amount of attention and you find yourself resenting their talent or resenting their fortune or resenting the attention that they get and we call that envy rather than rejoicing with them and being happy about it. But now here in the context of our lesson tonight looking at verse 14 what does James say? You better watch out lest there be harbored in your heart this bitter envying. And actually, the Greek text here um, indicates that James is talking about just, instead of getting rid of the envy, you just kind of hold on to it and you let it fester and you just let it get bigger and stronger and more intense to the point that you just become an old bitter person toward somebody else. Don't even like to see them. You don't even like to talk to them. You have to force yourself to speak to them. And he said, we can't get along like that. We're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. See, he's talking about how to treat one another and, and where, what wisdom comes from above. And, and look down at verse 17. See, the opposite of that is the wisdom that's from above is pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and, and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So we have to be careful as brothers and sisters that we don't let this thing of envy stay in our hearts and produce a bitterness along with it. Just an old sour disposition that ends up in those cruel, biting, harsh words and find ourselves critical about everything and everybody. So is it any wonder then that the Apostle Paul said in that text that Charlie read for us tonight, you put this away. Put away clamor and evil speaking and all those things but what was right there with it let all bitterness how do you do that would you decide to do it because it's it's an attitude and you decide what attitude you have you decide how to treat people and so you work on that, you discipline yourself to have the right attitude. And when some misfortune falls you, falls your way rather, as you've heard me say many times, and I didn't start the phrase, you recognize this can make me bitter or better. And that ends up to me. when something happens in the life of somebody else. You just don't let bitterness and envy dwell there. It all has to do with the heart. It's a matter of the heart. And you decide 
to be the way the Lord wants you to be. They're not quite, not seen quite as much now as they were for a while, but you know those little bracelets, the WWJDs? I've come to the place that I think I'd like to see a modification on one that would include not just what would Jesus do, but that would remind us to ask, what would Jesus have me to do? How would he have me, and which is really implied in the WWJD, but what a good guideline for us in life. In this circumstance, what would Jesus have me to do? And how to treat this person, what would Jesus have me to do? And when I go to work tomorrow, what would Jesus have me to do? How would he have me act? After church tonight, all in all circumstances of life, what would he have me to do? And if you follow that guideline, there's one thing that will never be present, and that's bitterness. With one exception, he would have you to weep the tears that come from bitter regret and in your penitence, come to him and humble yourself before him. Open your songbooks, please, to the number that has been announced. Greetings, everyone. 28 item search field. Item chooser, 28, heading. Closing item chooser. Search streams. Stream and track information. Button. Screen recording in progress. 1030.